Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it is a privilege to be here. My name is Andrew Ross Sorkin of The New York Times and CNBC. Uh, we are live in high fidelity here to you, uh, but this is going to be a conversation about the metaverse, uh, where maybe we won't really be live in the future. Maybe we'll all be all together in the metaverse. But there are so many issues that the metaverse uh, raises, opportunities it creates, uh, and we're going to dig into all of them this afternoon together. And we have an amazing group of people here to talk about these issues of governance, um, of potential regulation, what those opportunities really look like, potentially even issues around inequality. And then we'll get into the innovation and tech side of it as well. Let me introduce uh, who's here. Peggy Johnson's here, chief executive of Magic Leap. Um, we have uh, Omar uh, al Obama. Obama. Uh, he is the Minister of State for Artificial Intelligence, Digital Economy, Remote Work Applications uh, in the UAE. Uh, Chris Cox is the Chief Product Officer at Meta. They just changed their name to reflect this new world. And then Philip Rosedale is the co-founder of High Fidelity. But for the purposes of our conversation here today, uh, he is the founder of Second Life, perhaps one of the original metaverses of sorts. Um, to help level set where we are and what this conversation is really going to be about, and because I think uh, the metaverse means a lot of different things to a lot of people, and I think we don't really know necessarily uh, where we all are, I want to spend, if we could, about, only about 60 seconds, maybe 120 seconds, uh, getting a sense from all of you about what the metaverse is, and to the extent you can add how you think it's going to impact our society, I would love to do that. And I'm going to start, if I could, with Chris Cox um, on this issue. Chris. Thanks, Andrew. I wanted to start just with a message of support and condolences to the victims of the shooting in Texas, uh, to their families, to the affected community, and to the people of Texas. I know a lot of us are sending our hearts and condolences to them, so I wanted to start with that message. An important message. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Metaverse, I at least think about it as the next chapter, the next evolution of the internet, except it's the part where it gets less flat. If you think about the primary metaphors for the internet to date have been about web pages and literally two-dimensional objects that we peer at through screens. Um, one of the most important trends is in computing has been the computer moves from a basement to our desktop to our pocket. That has happened over the last 50 years. And we believe, I think we as an industry believe, that it ultimately gets closer to the senses, to the eyes, to the hands, to speech. And so keyboard input goes away, and, and peering at everything through a screen in our pockets eventually goes away. The metaverse is a way of describing the transition into three-dimensional environments. Why don't we go all the way down, and we'll come back this way. <laughs> Great. You know, for me, uh, as someone who you know became an entrepreneur and is, I'm an engineer uh, in 1994, uh, for me the metaverse was this idea really of a place that was somehow simulated on computers that were connected by the internet. So, as a young uh, entrepreneur, the dream that I had was what would people do if we could create an enormous single landscape, you know, that was perhaps the size of a city or something, and then let everybody come into that landscape and make things and build things, and so. The beginning of the genesis of Second Life was very much this idea of dreaming of a single shared place that we would inhabit together as human beings uh, and, and do things together. So that's what really uh, started it off for me. And now we've got avatars and behaviors and psychology and groups and all these other wonderful things happening. But that place idea is what really captured me. Oh, Lama? So if I look at this from a government perspective, the first thing that comes to mind is scale. So if you look at the Travis Scott example, the concert that he did in, I think it was Fortnite, 56 million people right. attended that. Yeah. It was a matter of scale. The biggest concert on earth is around a million people or a million and a few hundred thousand. You can definitely scale different goods and services to people across borders in a very seamless manner. That's the first thing. The second is I think it's a new form of expression. Um, we used to imagine text on screen. We used to imagine graphics. Now we can imagine new worlds. We can imagine new ways of giving these services. We can imagine a new, uh, let's say, paradigm between the virtual and the physical, which is augmented reality. And I think we can create a bridge that we could never have imagined in the past. What do you think? Well, first of all, I have a bit of a reaction to the word metaverse, uh, just having read Snow Crash by Neil Stevenson. It's a, that's a bit of a dystopian view that he had. 
Um, but I think at its highest level, I would think of it as the seamless merging of our digital and physical worlds. And I think actually currently in the conversation across media and publicly, we, it seems to me a little limited because it seems to center just in virtual reality. But when that actually happens, a seamless integration of your digital and physical world, that, that really is, I think, the true promise of the metaphors. And I think that's realized in augmented reality. When our heads what, are back What does back that up. look like? T tell us what so, it feels like. And, and some people here, I'm sure, have used uh, either a Magic Leap or an Oculus or, or, or worn a headset. And, and I'm sure many others have not. And so to, if there's a way to articulate it. Yeah. So I think they're very different. Uh, virtual reality, you know, you have a headset on and you're fully occluded. You're in, a, you're in another world. And it's fantastic. And there's use cases for that. Augmented reality is you're in, you put the headset on, you still see your physical world, and then we augment it with intelligent digital content. And, and there's different use cases for that, but they tend to get merged, I think, in this idea of the metaverse. Right. Chris, here's where I want to go. Um, there's a view in the world that um, there's a bunch of people trying to do, tr trying to create the next metaverse and, and, and different worlds within those metaverses. Um, the internet right now, um, there's lots of players in it, but of course there's a couple of big players in it. And when, when you start to think about how the metaverse uh, might look, you might start to think that actually only one or two sort of operating systems can win the day uh, because you're sort of living in this, in this universe and how interoperable these things can ultimately be. This now gets into Web3 and other things as well. But I, I'm sort of curious whether you think this is a winner-take-all sort of future. And to the extent that it, these worlds are going to be interoperable, how that would ever work. Yeah. So first of all, I hope it's interoperable. We want it to be interoperable. We, if you think about the hyperlink just as a really brutalist, simple metaphor for the structure of portability that made the original internet work was I could click on a blue word and you will go from one service to another service. That was the structure that enabled Google, that enabled sort of the first generation of web services to build utility, was we had some agreement on what the primitives were of the internet. The primitives in the metaverse are gonna be more complicated because travel, the equivalent of a hyperlink in the metaverse is I can go from Second Life into um, into a work meeting, and then I can go from there into an educational experience where I'm visiting the Coliseum, and then I can turn it all off, maybe, and be in an AR experience where I can just pull my messages up or I can uh, translate the person who's speaking a different language next to me. These are the kinds of things that I think we're all envisioning. You want them all to be interconnected, because from a user experience, that's just gonna be a better experience. The first thing you wanna do when you're in a Beat Saber, which is one of our most popular applications, if you're playing with your friend, is leave and go somewhere else. Um, not leave because it's a bad experience, but leave because you, you get bored and you want to you do something after it. The industry as a, as, a, as a coalition is spending a lot of time starting to talk about standards. What are the standards for an avatar? What are the standards for travel between one space and the next? What are the standards around privacy, uh, around encryption? around how things like report buttons will work. The report button is the key element to help somebody in an unsafe situation flag something about it. And how we manage those experiences as an industry are gonna be some of the most important questions on how we build something that's safe, uh, but also that provides lots of opportunity for developers. Philip, you've been at this for a long time. You think it's possible, all of these issues? Meaning that you can actually create an interoperable world that I can be in uh, one, per, one, one world, and maybe I've even bought um, you know, a digital pair of Air Jordans, and I can still wear them to the next place, and then I can uh, have my, uh, you know, my, 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 um, my, yacht, my, my yacht club monkey. Uh, do, do, you know what I mean? Like, can I, is, is all of this? I was like, I you get, bought a yacht in the metaverse? No, I didn't buy it. But, <laughs> am I going to be able to? But I think this is the real question, which is how interoperable these things ever can really be. Well, I certainly think from a technical perspective, we can do everything here. You know, I mean, between the, you know, the, the various technology companies that are working on this now at such scale, we, we definitely can make anything we want technically happen. I think the question is, uh, and, and if, if you're asking, you know, can we have a form of interoperability, say, an identity uh, and, and, and moderation that is a stable, uh, positive environment, I think that's certainly true. And, an interesting fact about Second Life, though, it's 
not experienced on headsets, it's experienced on screens. But an interesting fact about it is that it stands out as a remarkably positive experience overall for the people that are there. So strangely enough, and I, and I, I don't want to brag and say we anticipated this ahead of time, but the, the experience that people actually do have in Second Life for the people that are there, which is a smaller group than the whole world, but you know it's a million people, is remarkably positive. People get along. Um, they make new friends. They overcome uh, you know, divisive boundaries. So it's intriguing to note that technology is kind of neutral, but right now we're, we're appropriately concerned with some of the negative impacts it's had. But I think the metaverse experience and the particular experience of bringing people together with the right shared rules, the right, like, the right basic, basic rules about how they can interact does have the potential of uh, bringing us all together worldwide in the way that we're doing it right here. Right. Hey, Peggy, do you think we'll all be, do you think the World Economic Forum will live in the metaverse? Do you think we'll actually travel here a decade from now? What, what, and by the way, what is the, just give us even a time, from a technological perspective, a timeline for which this conversation, which themes, seems somewhat theoretical to people, is actually a reality. So a couple things. I do think we will replace some amount of travel with 3D meetings because, you know, pre-pandemic, I would get on a plane and fly cross country for a two hour meeting and then back again. And looking back at that now, it's like, why did we do that? Because we've proven we can do meetings, okay. Um, but, I, you know, the, the issues that you would have really truly replacing a physical meeting is you want that, that empathy that you feel when you're sitting next to someone, you see their, their body movements, their, their gestures, their eye movements. Much of that can be done in a 3D meeting. So when we put devices, in fact, we use this a lot, my management team during COVID, we would wear the devices and call each other and I would have a meeting, all my team would be there in, in, in my living room. And they were depicted though as generic avatars because you need to have cameras on you if you're gonna depict Andrew Ross Sorkin, you're gonna to need to have a bunch of cameras on you so we can capture you in 3D. Well, we didn't have that. But we did know where people's eyes were. We have four cameras on our device looking at your eyes so that we know where to place the digital content. Right. But I then could see, if you were looking at me, I could see that. And there's, there's a feeling you get when someone's looking at you, even in this augmented world. And if you walked around my living room and behind me, I could hear you. The spatial audio is awesome. And, and there's, there's just an empathy that you get in a 3D meeting that isn't possible right now in our 2D video conferencing. So I think a fair amount of those meetings can be replaced. Let me ask you a governance question. Please. Uh, you know, the internet is somewhat borderless, but um, is defined by regulations in, 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 in every country. It gets more complicated, I think, in the metaverse, in that really, if it works the way it's supposed to work, it should be a borderless world. And I could be in New York, and you could be the UAE, and uh, Philip could be in Hong Kong, and um, and the question is, whose rules are supposed to apply? You know, cr Chris mentioned this this tragic shooting that just happened yesterday, and I was thinking actually of a fascinating uh, and I think actually very scary situation, which was two weeks ago up in Buffalo, New York. There was a shooting uh, that was taken uh, live on Twitter. I'm sorry, on Twitch, um, and then taken down, and a lot of the other social media companies took it down. Uh, around the country in the United States. Yet there's a law in Texas, interestingly, uh, that's supposed to be about uh, free speech and censorship that says you actually have to leave it up. You'd actually have to leave up the video of the shooting, which is extraordinary. And so I imagine there's going to be different rules in different countries, in different states, and how you as somebody who's a, 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 a government actor thinks about that in this new world. Absolutely. So there are different types of risks that we need to pay attention to. There are risks that need to be enforced by government, let's say, financial transactions that happen in the real world for goods that you buy in the metaverse. Like you mentioned, the Air Jordans or the, the monkey yacht that you talked about. Or board, the board the, ape. Board I call ape. them monkeys, but that, that's an insult yes. to the board, board apes. <laughs> so, so if you actually pay money for that and you don't get it in the metaverse, someone needs to enforce that action, right? So that's one type of issue that governments need to talk about and, and in some way, shape, or form come to an agreement of how that's going to be enforced. Then there is the more extreme aspect, which is terrorism, really terrorizing people on the metaverse, because the difference is, if I send you a text on WhatsApp, it's text, right? It, it might terrorize you, but to a certain degree, it will not create the memories that you uh, will have PTSD from it. 
But if I come into the metaverse, and it's a realistic world that we're talking about maybe in the future, and I actually murder you, and you see it, it actually takes you to a certain extreme where you need to enforce it aggressively across the world because everyone agrees that certain things are unacceptable. There needs to be a conversation today at the level of the United Nations or the ITU or these uh, non-governmental bodies where a certain standard is set. That standard is set on the internet to a large extent where everyone agrees that the content on the internet is actually content that, for example, dark web content is illegal in many countries. Content that is not part of the dark web, that has not, nothing to do with drug trafficking, you know, uh, child pornography, etc., is acceptable. And we're able to use this common platform. I also think that there needs to be passporting between the different platforms or the different layers of the metaverse. So if Meta develops something and Magic Leap develops another, their, you know, their own platform rather than the hardware and actual software that you live on, there has to be some sort of interoperability between them. And the person needs to be able to choose the content that they go between. Because what we've seen today is there are a few things. Content is king. Why will you go to the metaverse? I think meeting on the metaverse is good, but I actually know nine out of 10 people that will say we prefer to meet face to face. COVID is an issue, they're worried about it. Right. But actually sitting and seeing people's body language, interacting with them, today is preferential. Why people want to go to the metaverse is because they're able to access content that they've never seen before, experience new experiences, play new games with people on a, on a larger scale. And it is important for us to have this conversation today and build at least the ground rules and work our way up. Do you think that's, you, you do business all over the world, Chris. Yes, that's right. Obviously. Yeah. And you're dealing with different laws and different mm. regulations in many different places. Is this doable? And is, it, is the UN going to be the, uh, the arbiter of how this is going to, in a, uh, you know, we call it the splinter net and, and, and deglobalization, is, is there a governing body that can actually make this work? There certainly are. If you, look at, um, if you look at child exploitation, if you look at terrorism, there are international organizations. Some of them are associated with the UN, some aren't. You want international standards, um, especially for things that are across, especially cross-border, like terrorist content. We already are in the situation where we're operating in Thailand, where there's laws against uh, you know, lay majesty, and we're operating in Turkey, where there's laws against uh, defaming Ataturk. You know, we're already managing, as are most internet companies, the reality that you want companies to have their own community standards to define their own rules, obviously out in conversation right. with the industry, but also to recognize that that exists in tension with national laws, and in some cases, as we're beginning to see, state laws. Right. There's tensions on both sides. I think the most important thing to say is, much like the internet, in the metaverse, you're going to have services uh, service companies operating different systems with different rules. Some are going to be way more open-ended. Some are going to be rated R. You know, some are going to be PG. And some of them are going to have sort of more or less um, strictures uh, around safety and integrity. There will probably be something like a rating system, which we have for film, we have for music, we have for other types of content, so that a parent um, or a young person can have some sense of what the rules are in their environment they're going to walk into. Um, just like if you walk into a bar versus a, a playground, there's a different expectation of what rules govern that, that place. Some of them are social norms. Some of them are enforced by um, people who run those institutions. The person who's running the restaurant feels responsible for the behavior of the people who are inside in some way, shape, or form. So those are some of the things I think we're going to play out. I think some are going to be um, similar to versions on the internet today. Um, but to some of the points that were made, it's going to be a much more synchronous experience. So it's not all going to be written down in text. Um, there aren't going to be probably nearly as much data associated with the communication because it's going to be happening over audio. Um, it's going to be happening in real time. Um, and for all those reasons, I agree completely, there's going to be a new set of problems as well as opportunities we need to think about and hopefully as an industry. Well, um, let, if, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, new set of problems. One thing that we're realizing is when you uh, put on the device and you go to reach for something, your eyes go there first, and yeah. then your hand goes there. Yeah, right. And then when you have these different input moda modalities, you can start to guess what the human's right. going to do before they do it. And that's an area that we have to think about from yeah. a privacy situation. Mm, yeah. I wanted to go ahead. I was just going to say regarding, you know, I'd, I'd make maybe a, maybe a more controversial statement, which is, you know, Second Life's always sort of thought of itself as a kind of a, a new country. And it was something that I often said when we were getting started. And 
I, I do think that while local, while local community uh, regulation is ultimately what we must build uh, in the metaverse, uh, if we have any hope of having a billion people uh, regulate themselves as they do in the real world, I think that in the same way that the UN emerged, I bet you that as these shared systems become more useful, say just for meetings, we will, uh, we will collapse to uh, a more singular set of rules, say around intellectual property or privacy. We, we can't do anything else. I mean, I think the efficiency will drive it. You mentioned privacy, and I want to talk about monetizing this world, because I think that's going to be a huge challenge. And maybe I'm, maybe I'm going to stir, this, stir up this conversation in a moment. I'm going to read you something uh, that you said, Philip, uh, about uh, Mr. Cox's uh, company. You said, if Facebook is successful at building a metaverse with behavioral ad targeting, it's just a very, very bad outcome. Okay. Um, and it's not inevitable at all. There's lots of ways that this whole universe can be monetized. Uh, that may be one of them. Uh, but I'm curious how you think about those issues and all of the lessons, if, if there's been any lessons learned over your time at, sec at Second Life, but also in this new world, Chris, at, at Facebook, at so the social media universe that we're all uh, sure. living through, uh, data tracking. Uh, we've had a huge debate, as you very well know, because you've been at the center of it for the last decade, frankly. Yeah. You know, uh, I mean, restating that, what I said uh, and what I meant, um, you know, there are two companies worldwide that, uh, that have built uh, tremendous businesses just in the last 20 years, um, which in internet time, I guess, is most of it. But still, it's relatively new. And, and those two companies are Facebook, Meta, and uh, Google uh, that, 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 that make money through advertising. The point I was making was if we move those models, which rely on making predictions about what you want and suggesting things to you, and, and in some cases, I think, manipulating your behavior, um, yeah, I think it's a terrible risk. Uh, the good news is nobody actually has to go there. And I, I, would, I would imagine that uh, uh, you know, Meta would also point out that it has you know, different models for things. The model that has to work in the metaverse, in my opinion, is a transaction or a fees model rather than uh, an ads model. That, uh, and I, I definitely stand by, especially. So is that buying section. digital goods and subscriptions? Is that? Yep. In a word, yes. Chris, is that, is that the model you're, you're I think you're, I think you're going to have both. I think if you want free services at scale, um, advertising is going to be the natural business model for it, just like it has for you know, since print. Um, and if you're going to want more narrow services that can be ad free or offer other um, sort of transactional uh, business models, you're going to have subs, you're going to have digital goods. Um, I think much like on the internet, you're going to have trade offs right. and you're going to want to offer a service that's good. Is there a way to do it yeah. where the user owns their own data? I mean, one of the sort of benefits of Web3. Uh, some of the blockchain things that we've talked about that may exist in terms of layering on top of this. There's this idea that maybe you could own your own data and even maybe sell it to um, maybe a meta or to other. I mean, how do yeah. you see that? So first, the user should control their data. Um, so at any, any sort of combination of events, the user should have the ability to delete, to understand, and to have controls over how their data is used. The user should understand that having data aggregated means they can have a much more relevant service. I mean, the exchange of you can have ads that are relevant to you or ones that are, are generally irrelevant to you is an exchange that comes along with basically agreeing to have data collected in a privacy safe um, and aggregated way. Right. So but we all, and I'm here in Europe with all of you now, and we all just click on the accept, accept, accept the cookie. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and even though we well, now we have more, we now have more control. <laughs> we ostensibly have more control, but in some ways we have less control because it's, it's very too complicated. It, it's too complicated to actually control. So, is there a way to change that dynamic in the metaverse? I do think what you're saying is that we have the opportunity now to reinvent some of what we've learned from the previous right. iterations of the internet. Um, so, you know, we're focused on enterprise, and one of our the earliest use cases is healthcare. So. Things like pre-surgical planning, rather than looking at a 2D screen and seeing the brain there, you can put the brain in the middle of the room and, and plan the surgical pathways. Um, certainly, we don't want any advertising in, in there when they actually then take that into the <laughs> operating room. Um, the world's most terrible ad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Something pops up there. Um, but I, I think that we have the opportunity to reinvent, and we should explore all those things now uh, right. it, because of what we've learned in the past from you know, the, right. the trajectories we've taken to date. So, so there is a thing. When you go to university, you have this orientation class. You get oriented into 
what is expected for, uh, from you in university and, and you know, what you should do. You get that at work. You get that in life in general. You don't get that when you use the internet. So most people are ignorant to what the trade-off is. And that's why we have these problems of, I did not know that I'm giving this much information and this is how it's going to be used against me to uh, monetize, right? There needs to be a way for us to orient people on what it means first to go to the digital world, not even the metaverse, what it means to use the internet. And this should be something that is in basic education in every single school in the world. Because you need to understand that, okay, you can manage your cookies, you can remove certain things that you don't get targeted. There are ways for you to actually pay and get that service, if there is, if that becomes a business model. And then it becomes the person's choice. If the person says, I actually like it the way that it is right now, I go for it for free, and they can monetize everything from me, then it's a personal choice. Today, people do not have the right for information. They do not understand what is happening and how they're playing a role. They don't have, in, in many countries, maybe in Europe they do, but uh, and probably in the UAE, the right of access, to access their data and to understand what is being collected, and the right to be forgotten, these rights uh, in that way. This needs to happen today for the digital world first, and then get implemented into the metaverse. Right. Because I completely agree with the points being made. Certain business models made sense for the internet and social media. For the metaverse, we need to actually take them to the next level. Can I ask you all a question? Um, I think one of the great opportunities for the metaverse potentially uh, could be around issues around education and ultimately could solve issues of inequality. But I was talking to a fellow last night uh, who made a very compelling uh, argument to me. I don't think I personally agreed with it, but I was fascinated by it. Uh, and he said, look, there's going to be people um, of means who are going to travel. And then there's going to be people maybe who are lesser means who might actually be able to use an, an Oculus or uh, a Magic Leap or some other kind of device uh, to travel to the same place, but from their own, their own couch. But in many ways, it's actually going to create even more distance between those, the, 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 those two people that, that psychologically, and I think that we've experienced this through social media, in many ways, it's brought people closer in certain ways, but actually created this remarkable divide because there's, it's even more visible, actually, the divide in certain ways. And how you all think about that? Well, I mean, I can I know that's a little deep, but. <laughs> no, I mean, it's okay. I think it's one of the central kinds of questions we need to be asking. We need to be studying and we need to be understanding. I mean, at the core, I think good technologies help us feel closer. And the key, the premise of the smartphone, the premise of the internet, at some level, at its, at its absolute most sort of primitive level, is a, is a democratizing force. It provides tools, it provides power for people. It especially provides tools for connection for people who cannot travel. Uh, and we've seen some of the most powerful examples of how the internet has changed healthcare, has offered access to a cataract exam, has offered access to a bank account, uh, has offered access to um, education on almost any issue, is, is just a really powerful idea and I think it needs to be one we don't lose sight of. Yeah. I, I think um, it is true at first, but with economies of scale, while you scale up the actual product or the platform, with time more and more people actually come on board. So ultimately, I don't think it's going to be a problem. Maybe in the beginning, the initial stages it will. But there are a, a few... Uh, very high potentially positive impacts of this. The first is, uh, there's a statistic of, uh, you know, 70% of what you read you forget within the first two minutes, right? It's because you don't actually experience that content. It's flat, you're reading it, some people have better recall or better memory, most people forget it. It's the same with video. If you can actually experience what you're learning, it sticks for much longer. And I think the same way that the internet unleashed a revolution of really improving human intelligence, democratizing knowledge, and today you have people building nuclear reactors in their backyards and they're 16 years old, uh, in some cases. It's because the internet... Less sure about that one. Uh, no, <laughs> no, it's true. So, so it is true. <laughs> no, it Less is sure true. that's a good thing is what I was saying. No, uh, uh, well, it, it just shows you the level of intelligence that people I have today. Like a 16-year-old kid has the level of intelligence of what a PhD in the 60s would take 20 right. years to study and achieve. So these things are positive, and I think that this will actually lead to a better future. There's also a lot more understanding that can be incorporated into the metaverse. There are people who have never traveled in their lives, in the US, in China, and India, and many countries. And they've never experienced seeing an Arab country, an African country, seeing an Asian. And to some level, there's ignorance there. I think in the metaverse, you can actually go and live in their houses, like in the metaverse, and see yeah. their cultures, 
and be a lot more understanding. So these are the positives. There are also some things that need to be addressed, as you rightly said. How do we ensure that it becomes a, a you know, not a have and have not kind of future, but a, a future like the internet where everyone can get on board and, and benefit from the positive outcomes of the metaverse from the get-go? And how can we reduce the delta? The internet, the, the first people on the internet, I think they were 10 years ahead of everyone else. Today we're seeing people in India and you know, in Africa going, going on board. How do we, do we reduce that delta? Well, you know, I think that uh, to just restate it, you know, inequality in all its forms, specifically wealth inequality, is as grave a concern for us, I think, as climate change as we move forward. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, Second Life, for example, is a company that for a long time has been meeting as avatars, as you might imagine, <laughs> for years. And, you know, we have people all over the world. And so we've had a lot of experience with this getting together and having meetings as avatars rather than a Zoom. But I do think, as you say, for exa an example of a grave challenge and danger that we now face is precisely this, that as we begin to travel again, we will separate into two classes, basically. Those with the means to travel and meet face to face, and those who are left behind on Zoom. And, no, and, and, and in hybrid meetings, a particular concern I have, those meetings we have with our teams where two or more people are in the room together and thus enjoy real eye contact and real intimacy, yeah. and everybody else is on the Zoom call. Yeah. Think, think how bad that's going to be. We don't know it yet because in COVID, we were all on Zoom. Right. The CEO was on Zoom. Everybody was on Zoom. Now we're about to have half the people on Zoom. So I have a different question, and this is something from your Second Life experience I'm very curious about. One of the things we've seen on social media is that people uh, act one way in real life. When we're, when we're here, uh, something I might say to you face to face, um, I wouldn't necessarily say to you, uh, something I, I would say uh, online, I might not say to you face to face. I think we're seeing this on uh, Twitter, all sorts of social media platforms where people, and, and by the way, even Slack inside people's companies, people will say stuff to each other digitally that they wouldn't say in person. And I'm curious what your experience with that has been in Second Life and how do you think that manifests itself, if it will, in a yeah. much larger metaverse universe that we would all live in? A great example about that, way back in the beginning when Second Life started out, but we had a substantial number of people that were hanging around in there. We had a, precisely this experience where we had a text forum, you know, something like Reddit or Slack, as we have today, and people would get in that forum, and just as you say, they would get very nasty with each other about, you know, what, what had happened in the world and why they were mad about it and why that person was terrible. And I would sometimes intervene in these things, and I would immediately go log on into Second Life and walk right up. Now, this is not with a headset. You don't need that for this experience. But if you walk up to somebody synchronously as an avatar and get within arm's length of them, you know, as an avatar, and they see that, and you both see that, and you say to them, hey, I saw what you wrote in the forums. What's up? That's, uh, you're really upset, you know? Every time the person as an avatar would say, just what we would say face to face. I'm so sorry, I don't know what got into me. I'm, I'm here to listen to your perspective. I understand there's two sides or you know, four sides to this or whatever. Um, so absolutely, one of the positive things that moves me every day to you know, keep coming to work is that when you get together face to face and it's synchronous and you're really talking, even online, even as avatars, not yet even in the headsets, uh, it definitely makes you behave the way we all behave to each other here. And is your sense that there will be people who will uh, live under their own names, but possibly other people who will live anonymously as avatars? And how does that work? I don't yeah, know who wants uh, to take th that. Yeah, go ahead, Peggy. Well, I, that's, that's interesting, just you know, given what's going on now with right. you know, anonymous Twitter handles and things. Um, I think it's going to be, particularly when we get to the point where there are cameras on you or you want to depict yourself that way, it's going to be, as if I'm standing right next to you and I'm going to have that same difficulty saying things to you, even if the virtual Andrew, that right. I wouldn't have maybe if I was online. So it, the closer we get to replicating the physical world, we're gonna feel that again. I feel it now when we have our meetings, just my internal meetings, and two of my team are over in the corner laughing about something. I'm like, what are you talking about over there? And you know, cause right. I feel like they're there. What, what, what what are you thinking about in terms of anonymous? Oh, I mean, and, and that, because this also has to do with democracies. I mean, some people would argue, you know, the Arab Spring uh, happened in part because uh, there were people who could actually act anonymously, but as a group online. Sure. How does that work in the metaverse? So I think you'll have both systems. 
Um, in the early internet, we had pseudonymity pretty much as the norm, pretty much everywhere. We can all remember the version of 2004 where you had your AOL handle, and that was how you used eBay, that was how you used um, you know, the early services, Reddit, Flickr, sort of the first version of events. I mean, the, the primary insight of the early Facebook experience was that your real name was required, and that that was gonna come with a completely different set of social norms for all the same reasons that there's centuries of research that the more distant you are from your real name and your real face, you'll take on different behaviors. Um, I think that's also good things in that. Um, but as I said before, and I think as a lot of folks have said, having spaces with different rules is going to be very important because you're gonna get spaces where you want real identity as the norm. I think a business meeting is probably a good idea. We're all wearing our real name on our, in front of us. Um, and there's gonna be some places where you wanna let people explore other identities. If you look at Roblox right now, one of the most amazing examples, I think, of the metaverse already being here. Um, if any of you have kids who play Roblox, you already have 100 million people using Roblox. Right. Two, it's on any screen. Um, and so because of cloud rendering and other technologies, any phone or any PC, and I think this is part of the equality conversation, by the way, is that VR and AR will be devices you can use, but they also need to be accessible from any device, any smartphone with an internet connection. Um, so to the core of the question, you're gonna want pseudonymity, you're gonna want it in certain contexts. For pseudonymous contexts, you want either a shared space, like we're, we're doing something together, we're at the same concert, we're at the same comedy club, we're in the same church or mosque, or you want moderation. So you want somebody in that space who feels responsible for keeping track of what the rules are and who feels responsible for the behavior inside. But you don't think that it creates any disconnect? Meaning, if all of us, and I don't know if you think, I'll, I'll ask you the same question I asked Peggy before, do you think that we could have a Davos, a World Economic Forum, that is completely in the metaverse, and that if everyone is just sitting on their couch all day long, all the time, how that changes just the personal dynamics that people ultimately have. There's gonna be trade-offs. I mean, I can imagine a, a lot more people being here that uh, didn't need to you know, burn a bunch of carbon flying planes and then expose ourselves without masks. I would kind of prefer that experience in some ways. Um, but on the other hand, you're gonna, there's gonna be personal interactions that are missed. And so I, I agree with Peggy, you're gonna want um, some version of events where you didn't really need to go travel there, but you could have the interaction. It should bring on people who weren't able to travel. Right. Um, but on the flip side, we don't want this replacing our real life experiences. Um, we have about five to 10 minutes left, and I do want to open it up for questions because I know there are people who probably have them. I see a hand up. I think there's some mics uh, around the room, and I, I will we'll try to uh, get to as many as we can in the limited time we have. Go ahead. Hello, and thank you very much. Uh, my name is uh, Sharif, and uh, I uh, want to ask a question with regards to another session that I have attended earlier, focusing on upskilling. Um, I think that uh, the metaverse will definitely play an empirical role in uh, addressing this challenge, because it was mentioned earlier that uh, historically, one needed to upskill once every decade. However, more recently, it should be done once every three years. How do you think that the metaverse can help address this point? Peggy, this is yeah, what you're doing. This is exactly what we're doing. It's um, like a plant. Yeah, thank you. Um, right now, we, we're finding that uh, training inside the metaverse is much easier to understand if you can be actually in situ. So for instance, a factory worker, um, rather than bringing everybody, all the new factory workers together and putting them in a room and training them for three weeks and then sending them out onto the factory floor, you can actually, almost from day one, put someone in with a, a headset on, bring them up to a machine. You can, it, in their field of view, they can walk through how to maintain the machine, how to diagnose the problems, maybe call an expert in, either a live expert or someone who's retired who had tribal knowledge of that machine that may have been lost, but now lives on in the metaverse for that factory worker. We're finding um, the companies that we've worked with are, are seeing about an 80% reduction in the t amount of time it takes to pro productivity from a factory worker. So I think it's a super awesome way to upskill people in the metaverse. I think we got a question on this side. We're gonna try to go very quick. So we're gonna keep each question to 30 seconds so we can get around the room as quickly as we can. 
Yes, Bastian Schiro, I'm a member of parliament from Switzerland. Very quick question, also important for democracy. What we see in social platforms is that extreme people tend to stick together and, and stay together all the time. Now, if metaverse is super attractive, people spend the whole time in metaverse, isn't there the risk that they don't meet real other opinions and this extreme divide no, or, or extreme groups and the divide of the society is reinforced or, or what can we do to avoid the this, issue no? of polarization who wants to take it I'll take, take it first I think there's two ways that we that there's two ways that we avoid that the first way is that our virtual spaces like the real world need to have in between spaces where we can meet in between groups we cannot we, it's very difficult to become extremist when you are in a room containing a number of people who have different viewpoints. Um, and so virtual worlds can bring people, lots of people together in one shared space. And by doing that, they can reduce the risk of uh, extremist behavior. The second one, which we can argue on, is I think that um, some of the business models, like advertisement, unfortunately have at least cracks that are slipped through where we are amplifying these behaviors through suggesting essentially worse and worse forms of, or pu pushing people farther and farther into polarization. So no ads and letting people share a single space rather than just be in a small room. Great, thank you for that. We have a question up front here. And then I'll come around to here and, and back there. Okay, Metaverse has three important dimensions. One is uh, massively multiplayer co-creation. One is monetization with NFTs and uh, manas and so on and so on. And one is uh, the old notion of immersive experience and interactions. We commented the two letters. What about the first one? What about unleashing collective creativity? How will it take that to the next level compared to social media? I think when the, when the common platform is established, um, then it will naturally become a massive um, millions of people online platform that they actually use. The challenge today is, so we're trying to solve two dilemmas. You have the hardware uh, issue. So how do you actually create the hardware for the metaverse? And you have people trying to create the actual platform. So Facebook migrating from a social platform to a metaverse engine, all right? And uh, what we're try trying to currently do is, I think, first get the platform right and then see how the hardware is going to complement it because that's how it's going to work, in my opinion. I don't know what you think. Yeah, yeah I, just, I would say that if you think about UGC video as being as one of the most important trends animating what you see on the, on the Internet today, UGC content was sort of what animated the first version. Part of what you see in, in Roblox, uh, just as an example, or part of what you see in... Um, early versions of these world building experiences, creating a world um, is actually just a really phenomenal kind of UGC that is just beginning to happen right now. Um, even the early versions of Second Life you were mentioning before were about world building. building. I think about my seven-year-old kid like playing with Legos and then inviting his friends to come see the world. It's like a very creative thing uh, to build a universe and then to invite people into it. So part of what I'm tracking is what are the worlds that are getting built by creators? Uh, we had a gentleman named Gabe Galt who came to visit Meta to build a, a replica of 1960s Memphis um, in order to sort of celebrate for Black History Month uh, the Tuskegee Airmen, Martin Luther King. So you would visit Memphis in the 1960s. It was sort of a, a memoriam to black history. Just an incredible thing that could have been a film five years ago or could have been a text post 10 years ago. But to your point, because you could visit and be embodied in that place, it took on a new meaning. So when we talk about creativity, I think we're talking about hundreds of millions of people or billions of people being able to create these environments and then invite others into them. And I think that touches on a lot of these themes. We're going to sneak in a couple more. We've got this one, and I'm going to go here. Then I'm going to go over here. And if I can, I'm going to go there, but I may run out of time. Go ahead. So this is Hudal Khizemi. I work in emerging technology R&Ds in UAE. My question is, how do you see the metaverse revolutionizing the way we build emerging technology today? Because Number one, we're basing this new model on a legacy system, and we need to be very careful because, for example, the right not to be analyzed, we don't have algorithms at the moment to prevent analysis if I choose as a user not to be analyzed. The right to be forgotten, we don't have actually algorithms that are built to forget you if you have a digital trace online. Plus, the fact that this technology is built on specific type of security parameters, the cryptographic parameters, that if the next evolution, as we have seen today, there was a declaration from the IBM CEO saying within 2025 we will have quantum power. And if we have quantum power, it deems 70% of our security obsolete. 
So what would happen to the metaverse in this sense? So how can we change the development and change of technology here? The way we develop technology for the metaverse, how can we change it? How would it impact the emerging technology norms that we are building, number one? And number two, how can you build that ripple effect? 40% of the world is disconnected. How can you build a technology where it creates a ripple effect automatically connecting the rest of the 40% of the world? Sure. Because right. you're focusing on connecting the actually 60% who are right. connected. Thanks. Well, let's, get, let's get a view from Chris real quick and a view from our, uh, our, our government official on the same issue. So first is I think to the question of how do we build something that's inclusive, I think part of what's so good about the, the way the metaverse is happening is we're in the very early stages and we're having the conversation at Davos. We're having the conversation in, um, among industry. The internet sort in some ways just, just happened and we found ourselves in, in many cases scrambling to understand how to apply some of the safety standards we wanted. We hadn't figured out encryption when the internet was born. Um, we hadn't figured out um, uh, examples like the right to be forgotten. I think the good news for now is we're going in with, a, with at least the internet as a set of examples that we can use for better and for worse on some of the, how we solve some of the problems. To the question on connectivity, a lot of us you know, collectively are working on connectivity. Um, there's gonna need to be infrastructure that's not built yet, one. I think a number of the folks here and a number of the panels have focused on that infrastructure. But I think number two, we need to make sure that it doesn't require expensive hardware. There needs to be consumer experiences on phones. We're quickly getting to a world where most people are going to have a phone, um, where they can have access to the experiences so that we're not, we're not building a universe for expensive, sort of wealthy, sort of early adopters. You know, I just want to add um, a few points here. Web 1.0, the level of knowledge and sophistication that we had about building this universe was very limited. It was like a yellow pages online on a screen and there weren't any rules or very limited rules. And as we evolved, we actually found out that there are so many requirements that we have within Web 2.0 and today within this socially connected world that we need to uh, enforce and actually put forward, like the right to be forgotten, the right of access, and so on and so forth. I think going into the metaverse, we are a lot more sophisticated about what the digital world needs, especially since we have precedents, right? Like Second Life, there are so many examples here that can help us actually understand what are the uh, first founding blocks of the metaverse. That's the first thing. On emerging technologies, I really think that expression is going to be better in terms of expression of imagination, IP, and so on and so forth. So you'll be able to build things on the metaverse, even if you did not have a lab in the real world or the chemicals or the resources necessary to build them. And second, we can simulate a lot better. So I think that we will be able to really build fast on the metaverse and then deploy in the real world if it works. Um, we have to leave the conversation there. We have gone over time. I want to tell you this was just so good. We could have kept going for a very, very long time. And I imagine uh, that we will be doing this again at Davos next year, hopefully uh, in person live, but maybe uh, in some version of the metaverse as well. I want to thank you. I want to thank everybody here uh, for a great conversation for your questions.